You're listening to the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. My name is Bill McIntyre, and it's time for this week's Long Island News, the show that talks to newsmakers from Nassau and Suffolk County that matter to Long Island and Long Islanders like you. So each week, we'll have a conversation about issues that affect all of us. I live on Long Island, and like you, I want to know what's going on with my tax dollars and where they're going. And I want to know more about the people making the big decisions that affect all of us, which is what this show is all about. Well, today, we welcome back to our show George Santos, the Republican candidate for Congress in New York's District 3, currently represented by Tom Swasey, who is vacating his seat after his failed gubernatorial campaign. Well, George, welcome back to this week's Long Island News. Thank you so much for having me Uh, again. It's always a pleasure to be here with you guys. You know what? Just just to start off, why don't you please remind our audience about, uh, you know, you, your background and why you're running for Congress and we'll just get the conversation started. Absolutely. So, um, as I stated before, when I was on the show earlier this year, I'm George Santos. I'm 34 years old. I'm um, born and born and bred, uh, bred and bred and raised New Yorker uh, in Queens. Uh, I'm running for Congress for the second time. Uh, I, I did run against Congressman Tom Swasey in 2020, and I, I, I made the pledge that I would rematch him for a second time. Granted, I never got the opportunity to really campaign in 2020 because of the pandemic. So, you know, it was a different type of uh, uh, endeavor then than it is now. Um, I'm, I'm running on issues that matter most to every American, every New Yorker, every person in the third congressional district. My issues are simple. It, we're running on inflation. We need to mitigate inflation. We need to mitigate the cost of energy. We need to also fight crime. Crime is out is, is rampant. It's insane. And it is unacceptable that it's 2022 and people are living in fear that we have uh, anti-Semitic uh, issues raging through uh, New York City, that we have Asians being targeted just because of how they look, and we have small businesses being vandalized and, and robbed at gunpoint at broad daylight. These are issues that hurt every single American and every single New Yorker in the third congressional district and beyond. So that's my platform. That's what I'm running for. I want to give, I want everybody to know that voting for me, supporting me is supporting somebody who never backs down and I double down somebody who brings the heat to the conversation and make sure that I keep people honest and engaged. So that's, that's pretty much my entire MO and platform. And I, I'd love to, to continue the discussion. Yeah. Well, to, to keep people honest and engaged is a big enough, uh, thing on your plate alone without all the rest of the stuff. <laughs> um, uh, but I, now I do know one of the big topics on the campaign trail is uh, the latest on abortion rights. So where are you on that issue? Well, I say this and, and I talk about it often. I am not for a full, complete ban. I believe in exceptions. I believe in tolerance. I, I am a pro-life person. I was born at twenty at 24 weeks gestation. So if, if you know, if you do the math, that's at the six months of pregnancy, which is in New York state, you are legally able to attain an abortion at that stage of your pregnancy. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's too much. Uh, I believe that we need to have a common sense consensus. When is too, when is too late? Uh, we need to give women all the options they want and need so they can make those decisions earlier on. Um, obviously, I believe in, 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 in abortions in the case of rape, in the case of incest, in the life of the mother. Those are not up for question. They never were. Th- those are common sense. Uh, no, one life doesn't exchange the other, and nobody should have to bear the child of uh, their perpetrator. So that's just period common sense for me. Do you think, um, but in, do you think the abortion laws will ever get to the, where you're, you know, there are states now that, uh, I mean, there was just a story in the paper a couple of weeks ago where a 10 year old girl had to leave her state and go someplace where she, where she could avail herself of those, uh, you know, those things. So there, there was no exceptions in that state. Well, I'm not familiar with the story. Um, mm-hmm. and I've become Bill, and, and I hope you appreciate this. I've become quite skeptical about certain stories that are circulating around because they all seem to be very conveniently timed. And I'm not saying I don't believe the story, but I, I'm not familiar with the story. I don't know of a single state in the United States today that is denying a victim of rape at the age of 10 an abortion. Um, I can name you a few. Yeah. I can name you a few. So you can, you know, 
it, you can hear the story and just say, well, that sounds a little crazy. So I'm, I'm just going to not think about it. And, and, but these, these are real stories. They really are happening. Um, yeah, well, that's very unfortunate. I, yeah. I want to make sure that people understand because look, my opponent's going to try to paint me as some radical extremist. Um, uh, he's taken me out of context in many conversations and many, in many interviews I've done. It's really easy. Unfortunately, politics is, is politics. Mm-hmm. And this is nothing more than a distraction from the real issues that are really plaguing every American equally. I think if you look at New York State, nothing really changed with the Dobbs decision. And I'm, and I'm now going to be a little selfish and talk exclusively in New York because I'm running to represent the third congressional district. And I need to really do what the people of the third congressional district want me to do, not what I want to do. Mm-hmm. And when I'm putting out polls and when I'm putting out, you know, th- those questions, Nobody's talking to me about abortion. They're talking to me about bread and butter issues. This is how am I going to keep my doors open? How am I going to keep the roof over my head? How how am I how am I going to be feel comfortable knowing that my kid is commuting to and from school? These are real everyday issues I get questioned on regularly. I, I did a public forum yesterday with my opponent. The question of abortion was never brought up because the audience was so flared on the economic status and the safety statuses of our communities that that's all we spoke about. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what's really at the front and center of every American equally here in this in in the third congressional district of New York. And I quite frankly, I, I see all everything else that the Democrats are trying to throw at me as to keeping us from talking about issues they cannot stand up for and they cannot defend because this is the record of one party rule both in the state of new york and in the federal government mm-hmm. and look i said it to you before i hate partisan politics i hate playing political pawns with people i hate using people as political pawns this is not about party this is about people but at the end of the day we need to allow this, the facts who, who hold themselves to be self-evident that these are facts People are more concerned about crime, more concerned about inflation, and far more concerned about the cost of energy. PSEGLI put out a a statement two weeks ago that our energy bill, our gas heating bill, is going to be three times more expensive come this come this winter than it was last winter Mm -hmm. those are facts those hurt the bottom lines of every single person equally some get hit harder than others but everybody gets the hit yeah well interestingly enough how do you feel about the uh the the federal reserve and what their um reaction to inflation is well i think the federal reserve has no option i mean if the if the white house and congress are not peddling policies that are going to mitigate inflation the federal reserve is going to have to do what they have to do in order to try to combat that i mean and and that comes at another another high cost look the real estate market is crashing slowly because nobody nobody could afford to go finance a home now well because it's the interest becoming- rates just went up right they just went up another whole point. Mm-hmm. See, here's here's my issue with the Federal Reserve. They're always what what they're doing by raising rates. Their attempt is to keep wages low because they feel that that's what fuels inflation. But they don't talk about the incredible profit that corporations have amassed in the last couple of years and how and people don't realize how inflationary that is. But they don't seem to be concerned with how much money corporations make. They're only concerned with how much money people are taking home. Now, it's not rocket science to say that if you want to spur the economy, you give the lowest end of the spectrum some money. They'll spend it. I agree. They'll spend it. You know, you're going to give you're going to give people with a lot of money more money. They're just going to stick it back in the bank and it's out of circulation. So we've let corporations run away. I mean, here, the price of gas a week ago was almost five bucks. And Exxon and companies like that are reporting $8 billion profits for a quarter. But the Federal Reserve raises rates and attempts to keep salaries low and has no no concern whatsoever for the other side of the spectrum. That's bothersome to me. I've always wondered what the hell we need the Federal Reserve for in the first place. It's just another layer of... Uh, you know, and to have all that high price beef sitting around a table deciding that they're going to raise the interest rate and it's a quarter of a point. We paid for that. Is that is that brilliance or is is that B.S.? Of course, it seems like B.S. I'd say to the me. latter, Bill. <laughs> yeah, it really seems like B.S. to me. It's a it's a tentacled octopus that has its fingers in the banking system. Oh, here's here's something I'll offer you, too, anecdotally, is um, 
that's that's a that's one side of it. There's another side of this that we need to look at is even though we're we're pushing and there's this national push for fifteen minimum dollar wage nationally. Yes. Look, sounds sounds great. I want people to make money. That's that's not that's out of the question. I want people to have access to fair wages. But every time we go in there and we push these laws, corporations, as you just mentioned, they find ways to innovate and circumvent those costs. So when I started having this conversation a couple of years ago, and um, and I, I, I come from the private equity sector, so um, I, I understand how these investment structures are built and where they span from. And uh, when the automation of kiosks for fast food deliveries, when that was being, you know, modeled and really heavily invested into, uh, the pilot system went into a California, San Francisco Bay Area McDonald's, where they put fully automated uh, kiosks for ordering and left one person working the register in case, you know, a senior that couldn't understand the technology or anyway, um, somebody who would need the help would come in. That uh, The study came back at the time, this was back in 2011, that a total of 10% of the clients who showed up to the kiosk would would have to go to the register. So McDonald's said, if we remove the register, we'd lose 10% of our business. Mm -hmm. But it equated to being cheaper to lose 10% of their business than to having a fully, fully, fully staffed uh, wait staff uh, on the register, which would be an increase of 20% of their on their bottom line on their overhead. Mm -hmm. So they rather they rather cut their losses and lose a 10% revenue than having a 20% burden on their overhead. And this is all spamming from the California laws at the time, raising minimum wage. So we need to make sure that at the same stroke that we're doing um, that we're doing uh, minimum wage laws, that we need to understand that businesses will find a way to overcome that because oh, sure. they'll have a one time cost in a machine. Yeah. And look, I go into my local food store, stop and shop. There's a machine that cleans the aisles and restocks the shelves. Mm hmm. <laughs> You know, it's, yep, this, yep. Is, this is really happening. Well, George, you know, I, I'm a little older than you, so I, I can remember some things that you, and I'm sure you're aware of them if you study finance, you know, during, I guess it's Eisenhower's term, and, and even after that, corporations, they had a 90% tax rate. And you're right, they did figure out ways to get around it. They spent that money on research and development, which were all tax deductible. They gave their employees better benefits. Things were much better when corporations were paying their fair share. And that's no longer true. Well, look, I, I look it's at pretty, it It's way. pretty simple. I mean, it, it, you know, you're right. No, no, simple, a, a corporation is going to dodge to do what they can to pay the least amount of money they can. But So I'll, I'll play devil's advocate, though. Bill. Okay. If we tax them out of the wazoo, which we have in the past, they leave. And with that, the jobs leave. And that's why we're facing a record crisis on supply chain in the States, because 70 percent of our manufacturing capabilities right. in the pharmaceuticals industry is in China. And we saw that during the pandemic. So there has to be. Well, that's yes, the, the law, lawmakers have let those loopholes lapse. That's why they get away with doing those things. You, you know, you can't you can't fix one I mean, end of the problem and then not make sure you you you, you know, close the loopholes. Um, oh, of course, and and that's where is their money come from? Where are our lawmakers money coming from? It's coming from those corporations. I mean, it's pretty simple to see that the system itself, you wouldn't accept this in your private life if you saw the the way, you know, that, that, you know what I mean? And yet as a, no, as a no, populace, no. we're letting this continue. Bill, I'll put it this way. Um, it, it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Yeah, only in politics do people fail upwards. And I say this and it's not a cheap shot. In the private sector, tell me one company that would allow their, their business to continue to fail and decline quarter after quarter before they fired whoever was running the company, the CEO. Mm -hmm. um, tell me one business in the world that would allow to, have, to, to spend money they didn't have in hopes of being able to recoup money they lost. Well, it's, it, it, you know what? Yeah. yeah, but it's my experience that if you're a CEO and you screw up a company, you get a golden parachute and a, and a couple of million dollars to live the rest of your life wonderfully. It's the company and the people that work there that take the hit, not well, the my, guy running point, the show. My point, I, I beg differ, right? We can look at Lehman Brothers and I can tell you that that's not the case. For yeah, everybody, lost their, everybody lost their job in Lehman Brothers. 
Yeah, my point, right? Including the leadership, they all got screwed up. Yeah, but who, but so, who did so, who did the screwing though? It was the guys at the top that decided which way the company was going to lean, and then everybody else well, takes the hit. You know, and the guys at the top walked away with probably nice retirement. Well, and I can say the same thing about the president of the United States today. He's going to walk away with his pension. He still gets his salary. The cabinet gets their salary. They all get their pensions, and the American people is suffering. Oh yeah, yeah. You, yeah. You made, who, else, who else? Who else gets? Who else? To, who else gets the vote on how much money they take home? Well, can you imagine? <laughs> can you right. imagine? Right. You know, and and there's talks in Congress, by the way, before the session ends, that they're trying to pass a pay raise. Yep. Can you imagine that the American people suffering? We're suffering out here. This is not a joke. This is not virtue signaling. People are having a hard time to make ends meet. Mm-hmm. And Congress is talking about passing a salary raise because right. they don't make enough. Yep. The squeeze, the squeeze is on four thousand dollars a year yep. to do 29 weeks worth of work. Yeah. The George. average American works 40 weeks a year and gets paid an average of thirty two thousand dollars. And they have to pay for their kids, their their housing. They have to educate their children. They have to feed their children. We're in an upside down society. Right. And in that whole atmosphere, we're still talking about fifteen dollars as a minimum wage. Fifteen dollars was an old story twenty five years ago. You know, people bring up fifteen fifteen dollars an hour. <laughs> what job do you know that would anybody would take for fifteen dollars an hour? Where are you going to live? Not on Long Island. Oh, you can't live in my district, unfortunately. If no, exactly. Fifteen dollars. That's why I want to exactly. make sure that we. But we need to fight in Congress, and I want to fight in Congress to make sure that if you do have a fifteen mil- minimum dollar wage, you can live in Long Island. Okay, then let's you get know, then let's get back to what happens in Congress. Now you you're in the Republican Party, um, and you're you sound like you're you're voting for the little guy. You want the little guy to do better. Uh, but what have Republicans voted for for the little guy in oh my God the last thirty years? So they, I'll put they, it this way to you, Bill. They haven't, made, they haven't voted any money for education. They haven't voted anything for the little guy. And they've mostly become just obstruction to anybody that wants to do anything. So I'll put it this way. Um, I'm a Republican. I'm proud to be a fiscal conservative. Um, and I, I've always said this. I have broken away many times uh, on positions with my party. Um, but I think that just shows you that I am more about the people, not about party. Yeah, but how do you survive? How do you survive in that atmosphere when you're going to be the lone gun? You're going to be the you're going to be the you one. Know what? The one sharpshooter that I have, I have a very long record history of being pretty good on standing up for what I believe in. I built an entire career that way. Remember, I'm a kid, son of two immigrants, first generation born American, born in Jackson Heights, Queens. And I was able to achieve status of becoming uh, vice president and executive director in major player firms in in Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And that was not by just being quiet or being the lone wolf. That was being the loudest lone wolf you can find. And with that, I was able to achieve the status of being able to have the awesome responsibility to run for Congress. So I think that my life story for itself tells you that I'm going to go there and fight. Look, I'm a proud... I'm a proud Republican and proud to be endorsed by labor unions. You know, when unionized labor is endorsing which, which, a Republican, that's which ones? because they know I, I talk the talk and I walk the walk. I have I have the Transport Workers Union Local 252 in, in, in Nassau and Suffolk County on Long Island. Um, I have two others that just gave me the heads up, but I don't have the letter, so I'm not in the liberty to share. Right. I have law enforcement unions who are share who are endorsing me. So th- these are mm-hmm. these are you know bread and butter issues. These are people. This is the rank and file. Yeah. I have I have local unionized labor behind me because they know I talk the talk and I walk the walk. Okay. You know this isn't for me. It's not about talking points and gaslighting. For me, it's about getting the job done. And mm-hmm. I'm going, I have no record because I've never held elected office, mm-hmm. but my personal life record, my personal life is a record of its own. And I want to make sure that people know that they're going to be represented. And I am going to fight for the most aggressive education reform in this country. We need education. Education is a springboard out of poverty. There's no reason that people in inner cities all across this this country are having subpar education because politicians rather play nuclear football with them instead of giving them what they really need. Okay. Education will resolve a lot of the issues uh, for the future. Well, let me just interject and remind our audience that uh, we're here at 90.3 WHPC, this week's Long Island News, and we're talking to candidate George Santos. It's one thing in the private sector that, uh, you know, to go into a company and create new ideas and do things like that. But in, in my mind, the way I see this is, if the things you want to get done are sincerely what you want to do, you're going to be up against your own party. 
and not just the the confluence of of the population who agree and disagree with some of the things that you want to do. Um, because I, you know, you said you hate partisan politics, but <laughs> your party is is exhibiting that to the nth degree. Everything is is voted on along party lines. I mean, we mm-hmm. as we as as people who read the news or just look at the the voting records, and it's not good, George. I, I you know, I mean, I, I I disagree, Bill. Look, I'll I'll push back on you and say. We just uh, 47 Republicans just joined the mar- the the marriage equality uh, co- codification in Congress. Um, what, is that, what does that mean? Vote- what does that mean? Well, Mayor's well, codif- saying, what is that? They, they voted to codify to codify the Marriage Equality Act to, this, to the right to same sex marriage in the country. That's 47 Republicans. Right. Then you also have 12 Republicans who voted for the infrastructure bill. So it's not true that it, it's all party part part party. Uh, uh, partisan voting lines and and remember this too well when, you know i've got former... i've got 60 examples george you just gave no, no, me hold one on. let, let me <laughs> let me conclude this thought real okay. quick so okay. when when the prior administration was in office and the democrats had the the house they didn't pass a single bill to, to advance anything the prior administration tried to put together an infrastructure deal and it was shut down because it's all partisan politics well is that like Grid is that the same is that the same as the health care deal they tried to put together that never materialized they talk a lot but I, you don't see much substance you know I, I, uh, I, you I'll can put this. these you I can put these things out i look at the voting record and that's in granite that's black and white what they did and didn't vote for. They didn't vote to give all those first responders the insurance they needed. They didn't vote any money for education. They, I can say, I can go right down the line, George. And yes, sir. You, and you, then I can go down the line of how Democrats have voted to put us into financial disarray. Yeah, but, but see, again, as running as a candidate, you're supposed to be telling me what you're going to do and what well, you can well, do, I, not I, what I the other guy did and how much you disagree with it. You know, hundred percent. I, I can, get tired I of that. You, but since, since, since we went towards that direction, I'm obviously going to defend my party and I'm going to also expose for the listeners to, li- to that yeah. are listening that Democrats, too, are, are responsible for the chaos that we're in right now. Look, in 20 months that Joe Biden's been president, our country's fallen into utter chaos. We have crime rampant across the country. Democrats aren't voting to do anything to change about it. No. We, we have a criminal bail reform uh, reform here in New York City and New York State, pardon me, that allows criminals to have a revolving door access. They commit nonviolent. Yeah, violent, but the statistics, you know crime. what? The statistics do not show that. They don't well, show the know, recidivism you know. that you guys are, are standing up and screaming about. Again, it's a it's a. You know, you, to Bill, put you something under the microscope and make it, you know, I can take one shooting and put it under the microscope and then shoot it to the world. And all of a sudden we we live in a crime ridden city. But that's, that's what the Democrats do about every massive gun violence, as they well, call e- it. Even if that's what shooting. they even if that's what they do do, is that how you're justifying you're doing it? No, that doesn't make them not. right I'm either. Giving you, <laughs> I'm giving you facts. The facts are simple. The crime, the, the bail reform crime laws in the state of New York. Mm-hmm. If any person says they need more data, that means they want more victims. And if you want more victims, that means you're telling your listeners that you want to see more people shot, more people stabbed, more people shoved in subways, more, more. Uh, and those and those were all done in. by people who were let out on on bail. No, those are all done by people who are let out without bail. I can oh, go down. Oh, oh. I mean, the, the New York Post. Uh, okay, so all the Post crime from this year. <laughs> the New York Post. Hold on, Bill. The New York Post earlier this year. Let's be truthful with ourselves. Mm-hmm. Had a, a cover that said 101 damnations. The man was taken into custody 101 times before they finally had enough evidence to hold him in because of the new discovery laws. This is new, this is Democrat controlled New York. Like the guy who stabbed Jose Alba. The DA in Manhattan wanted to keep Alba for defending himself in jail and, and even failed to go ahead and, and prosecute the girlfriend who stabbed Jose Alba. Like this is this is the state. This is Democrats. They own this. They own the crime wave, not only in New York, but in the country. Well, I, you we know what? OK, people set fire to the Minneapolis Police Department and nobody was held accountable for it. Right. OK, so so if we're worried about if we're, nobody. If we're Nobody worried about was crime, held accountable for any of those crimes. And if we're worried about gun crime, when are when are but Republicans going to vote for some sensible gun but laws? You're going back to gun crime. How well, I mean that's what we're talking about, isn't crime? it? 
I, talk I, about I, some violent crimes in the streets that when you're commuting and you're being shoved into a tr- uncoming train. I commuted for I commuted platform. for 20 years and none of those things ever happened to me. So I, I yeah, have a I kind of have a problem. I'm very glad. I'm very glad it never happened to you. It's never happened to me. And I've commuted my entire adult career into Manhattan. Well, but you. the reality is. We have people smashing feces on the in, in subway riders' faces, and they get away with it. Like th- these, are, these are the insanities of the Democratic Party. That's not the party. They I think there's a lot of other things uh, uh, involved in that. Yeah, but okay, and, well, and, and, and I will, I will conclude this se- segment of of crime with this. Mm-hmm. Point to me one gun law that has been effective in taking out guns out of the hands of criminals. There is not a single one. Do you know why? Criminals do not follow the law. The law is for law-abiding citizens. Every time you pass a bill, whether it's a gun bill, whether it's a crime bill, all it does is affect people who follow the standards of law. Criminals do not care. They will evade the law at every given opportunity. We need to make sure that we incarcerate them every time they commit a crime and we hold them in there for the statute of limitations of whatever is the crime they're committing and stop giving them a slap in the wrist and putting them back out in the streets to commit more crimes. And that goes for everybody, right, George? That goes for everybody, right, George? That goes for everybody, right, George? That goes for everybody, but the Democrats want to coddle criminals. I just wanted to know that. We have over 200 laws on the books. No, I know. How, how about... Uh, Criminals don't follow the law. We, we, also, need to, we need to uproot them and put them in jail. We need to we yeah. need to invest in mental health to stop these people from getting to that point. Oh, well, that's but a whole no, other thing. Instead, yeah. yeah, very instead, true. Instead, all we hear is people virtue signaling that a mass shooting, AR-15s need to be banned. The AR-15 did not grow legs and walk itself to the scene and start shooting at people. No. A sick, deranged person did that. That should have been identified. In, in most cases, I'm not going to say it's all cases. In most cases, these people have a track record of some instability, and either the family failed, the school system failed, or even their health care providers failed to identify them, report them, and keep them constrained. Mm-hmm. Instead, they go ahead to get these illegal guns or legally, whichever way, because everybody's failed to do their job. And then they go and take lives away. Yeah, Every yeah. life lost is a tragedy, yeah, whether I, it's I by gun violence, by any kind of violence, I will never, I will, I will never excuse. Right. I, I see every life loss as a tragedy, especially when I see eight months old in a stroller in a barbecue in Brooklyn being shot by thugs who had a violent criminal rap sheet and were out with no bail a week later. And they shot an eight month old on a stroller in Brooklyn last summer. Well, that is a tragedy. Right. And rather than say it's of this party or that party, we should be going after the people who made those decisions and changed those people's All lives. Of them who are Democrats. No, well, that's Every that's, single one that's, of them, that's, Bill. That's, and you know that's not true. That is hundred percent true. No, no, in the state of New York, there's just, not a single chamber of, of government that is yeah, controlled I know, I know. By, dem- by Republicans. Okay, it's George, well, li- listen, we're going to have to agree to continue this conversation some other time because the clock's screaming at me. So um, <laughs> no I, I, problem. we just want to let the uh, listening audience know that we've been talking with George Santos, the Republican candidate for Congress in New York's <laughs> District 3. And George, again, we want to thank you for coming on. And uh, uh, Thank you for having me, Bill. It's a pleasure to have spirited debates with you. I really enjoy Enjoy it. And we'll we'll continue. So you know, uh, up as we get closer to the end of the campaign, we'll we'll get on and uh, we'll do some more again and see how you're making out. Okay, let's do it. You bet, man. Thank you so much and have a great day. Okay, you be well. You oh, too. Bye-bye. Okay, the clock on the wall says it's time for this week's Long Island news to get on out of here. Remember to listen every Friday at three p.m. right here on the Voice of Nassau Community College, ninety point three WHPC.